Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It has been a whirlwind of a week. Big week. A really fun week. So it was the Aquascape Pond installation. It's done. Uh, Aaron and Bethany ran drip to all the plants. We are planning on mulching tomorrow morning. So we're gonna kind of like tidy the area up. But I mean, the experience of these, they're called CACs, Certified Aquascape Contractors. Yeah. So all of them are certified contractors. Um, some of them are artists of the year for like pond artists of the year for three, three of them were, mm -hmm. did I just say that <laughs> for, yeah. for a three different years? Um, one of them was like a DIY pond artist of the year. Uh, these are like the, the pros, the dream team. Yeah. From across the country. They're like the ones that are award winning. Award, yeah. Award winning. So New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, Chicago, uh, Illinois, uh, Utah, Washington, some people drove up from Southern California with all the plants. Did you say Tennessee or Kentucky? Oh, or? Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah over. I mean, it's just like, it was amazing. So uh, everybody left yesterday afternoon. So today we were out kind of just like putting pallets away. I put big stumps that we didn't use away and just kind of cleaning up around the area. And it's just my favorite time in that space right now is early morning. Yeah. Like right around seven o'clock in the morning. Well, it's nice because our neighbor, our neighbor has that tree. Yeah. Kind of like um, it shades that area till what about like nine? Eight thirty. Eight thirty. So it starts peeking over. Sure. And it's still beautiful, but it's still getting very hot. Our ten day is like ninety nine to one hundred and five, mm. like right in there every day. Um, so it's like once that sun gets over the tree, you can feel the heat start creeping in. But yeah, early in the morning, it's just. I was sweating bullets about all the stuff that got planted. Yeah, you were stressed about. I, I was. Not. super stressed well because i tried to start watering those plants in mm -hmm. and the water just rolled away oh. and so you know that none of that water is getting down to the root ball mm -hmm. where it actually needs it and i'm just creating these like channels in the mm. in the powder yeah and so i thought you know with drip it's so awesome because you know you can run it and all the water stays because it's, sl it, slow, it's enough. So slow enough mm -hmm. that it, it you know soaks it up and mm -hmm. gets right to the root ball so what like drip is so efficient mm -hmm. it and really I think is. it's so much better for the plants yeah. than um i mean you just use so much less water and you get it where it needs to go right and all the soil that we used for all the berms came from the pond hole and then also from our dirt pile that we've been creating over the past two years you know every time i've got a container that has extra soil or last year's soil that i want to clean out there it goes into that soil pile anytime we have excess soil from digging holes for other trees it's where it goes um I, I don't know how the initial pile started, but it was quite large. Yeah. You know, we have a big old like hole. Well, yeah. Okay. So we removed the whole dirt pile and moved it all back here and used it for berms. But we still needed quite a lot more. So they took an excavator out there and right where that dirt pile was, they just dug a great big old hole and yeah. somebody had a dump trailer. So they'd fill the trailer and they, I, they did that three or four times. Yeah. And now I'm like, well, we've got ourselves another pond right out here. You can just fill it with water. You could do that. Uh, what is it? Like Google culture? Oh yeah. We could start um, putting branches and stuff down yeah, in there. Yeah, like logs and... Yeah. I saw that hole this morning. Compost. I was like, dang, that is a hole. <laughs> you know, my grandpa would do that in Minnesota. Like, mm. they threw all their debris. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes sense. It's like... So they do a land? A, yeah, dig a big hole, you know, throw all your mm -hmm. brush and stuff in there, and then just cover it over, and mm -hmm. it'll just compost. Right. Returns you know? to the earth. Right. Yeah. Anyway, all that said, it's just been a wonderful week, and it was... It was when everybody left, it was almost kind of like... Oh. Yeah. Like, like we're here, we've got this beautiful pond, and I'm so excited about it. But it was so fun being with everybody. It was a really great group. But anyway, let's jump back in time to some videos that we did before the pond happened. It actually feels this first one's harvesting wheat and making wheat wreaths with my uh, mom, sister, and Benjamin out in the flower shed. That feels like another life ago. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, so we grew the ovation soft, what was it, soft white wheat? Soft white winter wheat? Can't even remember now. <laughs> All other information has left my brain <laughs> at this point after this week. Um, but we started it last fall. It came up beautifully, amazing, amazing crop. I talked all the details about that wheat in the planting video. Uh, it grows a lot like garlic in its cycle. Like you plant it in the fall, same as garlic, and you harvest right around or after 4th of July, which is what we've done. Um, and there was very little, I did not fertilize it. My dad told me, like, he asked me this spring, have you fertilized your wheat yet? I said, no. And he goes, well, you probably should do that. Farmers do that. I was like, well, eh. <laughs> I put a lot of fertilizer in the ground before I planted it and I planted it thick. I mean, there was a couple of areas where I noticed uh, definite heavy handed planting more so than other areas. And the uh, 
the heads of the wheat were a little smaller because they were competing. Sure. So they were a lot, like way too thick in that area. So I did learn a little bit, but it doesn't matter. That whole area is just, most of it's amazing. Uh, Carmen said, what a great video. I've seen you do Reese before, but just cut that. It's different when you're left-handed. Yeah, my mom's left-handed. It's so funny growing up, my mom trying to teach us all these things, how to knit. So I um, learned how to knit initially left-handed mm. and it wasn't like it didn't feel natural I didn't like it and then we figured out like oh well I am right-handed I probably should learn how to do it the other way <laughs> you didn't think of that well well no because I didn't know I mean my mom's just like here here's how you knit yeah. you know and she's just showing me which didn't even think about it yeah um and That's so funny. anyway so she had to like kind of retrain her brain to show me how to do it right-handed sure um, and then it clicked and I liked it a lot better but yeah it's very different when you're left-handed everything's just opposite um, and it looks weird, you know, if you're left-handed, it looks weird to do things right-handed and vice versa. I've looked around my area, but can't find any wheat seeds. Is that something I can look for online? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Andrew's seed, that's my parents' garden center, if they have it listed online, but I know they've shipped out a lot of wheat since this video. Hmm. Um, so you can get it in small quantities from them online. Send them an email. Uh, Pata said, as always, great video, wondering about growing wheat. What variety of wheat seed would I try to find? It depends on what you're going for. Um, in this case, it's purely decorative. So I wanted something with awns. I wanted those you know, spiky things on the end of the wheat head. You can get onless wheat, which is nicer in that um, it, it's like cleaner. It's mm -hmm. not as pokey. Uh, I thought about maybe trying a little bit and creating a, a like a clean wheat wreath look, you know, not so puffy. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But uh, there's different types too, like the hard red wheat, I think is more for bread making. I might be wrong, but, uh, and I think the soft white winter wheat that I've grown is good for like uh, cake and pastry flour mm. and pastas and things like that. It has to do with like gluten and like the protein in it. I don't know. I don't know a lot about it. This is just like random information that I'm just trying to recall at the, yeah. <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but you can just do a little bit of research about the different types of wheat and it depends on what you want out of it. Always be weeding said, could you always make a double-sided wreath so it looks good from both sides hanging in the doorway? You absolutely could. If you wanted to do that though, you'd need to do it when the wheat's still kind of green. Because if I tried to do it at the stage it's at now, we'd have wheat everywhere, it'd fall apart. Um, so one-sided is how we have to go. And then all the wreaths that we made in this video, we made 10, uh, they are being displayed down at Andrews in their windows here in the next couple of weeks. Usually they switch over to like late summer, early fall decor, about mid-August. So um, they'll be going up. And in this case, we're going to cut little rings like donuts of um, burlap. And we're just going to hot glue them to the back of the wreaths so you don't see the, like the form, wreath form and all of that. Uh, Joyful Things said, how long did this take in actual time? It took a long time. Uh, we made, I think we made six or seven wreaths the first day. And uh, let's see, do we have seven? Yeah, six or seven the first day, and then my mom came over, and it was only from about, do you remember what time she came out? It seemed like a long time. I know, it was like, I think she was here from 9 to 2.30, so we were out there like maybe five hours to do the six, six seven reads. We were talking a lot, though, and Benjamin, we were playing with Benjamin, and, um, and then the next afternoon she came, and we made the remaining four that we needed to make, and that one went way faster. I don't know if you just kind of like get into the mode. Sure. And also when you're trying to kind of push through the last part of a project, after you've made like one wreath, I don't really love to make <laughs> a whole bunch more. I mean, it was fun because we were together. Um, but by the end, you're just trying to like, let's just bust through this and get it done. Uh, Silver Sage said, what became of the blue wheat you started from seed? Oh, yeah. Did I ever start that though? I don't, I don't think I did. Did I? Forgot about it. Hold on just one second. Here it is. <laughs> I haven't planted it yet. I completely forgot about this. So what is this kind? This is, so the blue color with black ons. Fancy. So I wonder though, should I start this, this one this fall? I'm so glad you said something because I would have probably forgot about it again. Our Michio 6036 said, is there a way to prolong the wreath? Can you spray it with something? Some people will use like that spray adhesive stuff. Some people even say like Aquanet hairspray, like just something that will kind of help stick it together. Um, you know, next year I think we'll try to get after it a little sooner than we did. The wheat that we were using is just about like the wheat we use every single year that we've gathered out of farmer's fields. It's always pretty dried down and um, by the time you're done there's a lot of mess everywhere but the wreath still looks really pretty. Um, 
I think next year we will try to get after it when there's still a little bit of flexibility in them because it'll be a lot less messy and a lot easier to manip manipulate the wheat. Catherine said, I noticed there's no closed captioning on this video and some others. Is that something that is out of your control? I, you know, I don't know why some have closed captioning, some don't. So yeah, I, as far as I know, it's out of our control. Hmm. Vernita said, your mom's hat is brilliant. Where did she get it? Um, she got it at the garden center. She usually wears that great big, like wide brimmed, mm -hmm. like kind of just tan hat. This one's wide brimmed, but it's got like black and tan. Mm -hmm. Like it's got a pattern to it. It might be Tula brand, T-U-L-A, I'm not sure. Okay, next video was the six week hay rack update. They look so great. And it says they look so great. Oh, I noticed that I put an S in there in the title. Oh, did I not fix well, it? Well, is it still you wrong? didn't fix it, and then I meant to ask you to fix it, and then I forgot. So it still says they look so great. They do look <laughs> so great. <laughs> but they, yeah, they really are doing well. Um, we just walked down the line of hay racks, show you, showed you how they were looking. I gave my thoughts on the plant so far, and then we went around the garden and showed you a few of them that I had left over um, that I popped in the ground see how different they looked there versus in the hay racks. Uh, Carries said, is the coconut Nemesia fragrant like traditional Nemesia? Um, traditional Nemesia fades in summer for me too, but I love the fragrance. Um, you know, I haven't noticed a fragrance on that one like I do with the Aromance Mulberry. I think it's called Aromance Mulberry. It's amazing. Um, and the Nemesia in the hay racks is doing pretty well. We had it in the ground in that brick patio area and several of them have died and Aaron you said that um that that area is getting tons of water so it's not a water yeah. issue I don't know what's going on with those I the shade like just too much I don't know I don't know if it's the the spacers on the drip drip if it's actually too far because there's a surefire begonia that's bit bit it too pretty hard mm. um, yeah it could be all the coleus is doing great. You know what the interesting thing is though, and I don't know if you've noticed this. So in that brick circle, I use King Tut grass. And then we've got a mixture of Lime Time coleus. There's Wicked Witch and the Golden Dreams. Golden Dreams is a total like water baby. Like mm. Lime Time and Wicked Witch are like, yes, like doing their thing. It's 105 degrees and Golden Dreams is like, mm. yeah. and I go out there and I give it water and then Bethany goes and gives it water and then I go give it water that later in the day and it still wants to wilt. And that's what I experienced with that variety in mm -hmm. front of the gazebo, remember? Like every day I had to go out there and give it tons of water and it still would wilt. Yeah. It just like, it'll get big and it can do sun, but it like, I mean, Maybe it can't do right. sun like the others can. I don't know. It's such a pretty plant. Well, you plant. know, some varieties of petunia, super petunias are like that too. We found that some, you know, prefer different things. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like that where it's just this one is kind of a weenie. Maybe it needs just a little bit more shade. Yeah. Also, surefire begonias can't handle the sun like we thought they might be yeah. able to. <laughs> well, yeah. The other thing is that... Um, I don't know if that spot is quite getting enough water for the amount of sun that it's in. That's true. It's really hard to, to make We're it work We're talking about though. around Persephone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the ones on the backside get more shade and a little bit more water too. And I don't like, aside from switching how the sprinklers work, I don't how know do how they to get more that. water than the front. They're well, all in the same space. Because the, the sprinkler from the back waters better back there. Mm. Uh, it's, you know how like, okay, so if you've got a sprinkler that does like more than a half rotation. Mm -hmm. It takes longer to get to each area mm -hmm. where if you've got a sprinkler that's like a quarter rotation, it's, that area yeah. is getting twice as much water as a sprinkler that's, you know, yeah. doing, anyway. So aside from if, like adding another sprinkler somewhere, mm -hmm. I don't know how to fix it. No oh, dang. It's just like a hand, tough. Hand water, but we don't want to have to do that. Yeah, it's a tough thing to fix. Uh, Peter Winston Aldridge said, when I think of Oregon, I do not think of such high temperatures. In your experience, have your temperatures been rising over the years? Nope, they haven't. They've been the same. Uh, we are high desert. So we are in the eastern part of Oregon, which is completely different than the western side, which is like what you think of when you think Pacific Northwest. You think of evergreens and ferns and rain and fog and all that kind of stuff. And that's on the other side. We are hot and dry and but we get four seasons we have a long growing season um we still get cold in the winter time and mm -hmm. it our nights cool way down in the summer so we could get 105 during the day but it gets 65 at night and it takes a little while during the day to get up to that 105 
Um, so you have a pretty nice morning and it's dry. So you don't have that humidity mm -hmm. factor. So it's very comfortable to be outside in the morning. Um, I, I feel like I'm growing to appreciate our area more and more mm -hmm. as I get older. I kind of feel like I am too. Yeah. As I get older and have experienced other areas where you can, where people garden, I'm like, um, yeah, we deal, we deal with some pretty crummy stuff. Everybody does in mm -hmm. their own area, but you know, this is home yeah. and everybody probably feels, I'm hoping feels the same about their home that we feel about ours. Happy Place said, the sound is so good per usual on this video, even with the wind. Can you share what mic you're using? Oh, I hate our microphones. Oh, I hate them so much. What are they? Tascam. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> I need, I need like the unicorn microphone with, with no weight that's like weightless and wireless. There you go. That's what I need. Yeah. I don't know how to fix it. Uh, the reason that we use the Tascam is that it's a little lavalier microphone mm -hmm. that with a little wire that goes down to a little pack and it records onto an SD card. The nice thing about that is that you can, you can, rec they'll record all day. Mm -hmm. So you can wear it all day and you can get, literally get like eight hours of audio. And then what you can do is you can sync that audio with anything. You can sync it with an iPhone. You can sync it with, you know, nicer cameras like this. You can sync it with a GoPro. Um, whereas like a lot of the other microphones that you get, you have to like plug something into the camera that you're using. Mm. So it records the audio directly to that device. So if you're using your phone, you have to plug it directly to your phone. So if you switch cameras to a GoPro, you have to be able to plug it into the GoPro. Right. To it. So it's a, it's, it's nice because you can, we use a lot of different cameras for mm -hmm. what we do. We do. I switch often from my phone to GoPro, mm -hmm. especially because the GoPro doesn't get close up shots at all. Like I could be like this and then holding my GoPro and it's focusing on whatever is behind it mm -hmm. always. So I, if whenever I do anything close up, I always get my phone out so that you guys can see it clear clearly, or I try to remember to do that. But the problem with our mics is that wire. So the wire that comes, you know, I usually slip the mic pack just down my shirt and then hook the thing, whatever the mic to my tank top, mm -hmm. but that, and then I wheel up the extra wire. Once I hook it to my pocket and like shove it into my pocket, it comes out during it. Cause I'm up and down, you know, moving around. And then it's like inevitable. If I bend over to do something that wire hooks around my knees. So when I stand up, like yanks my shirt down and usually yanks the mic out of my pocket my pocket hits the ground, my battery flies out. And I'm just like, uh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> really bad for effect right there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I just, huh, I mean, I'm thankful to have good audio and then I'm thankful to have the mics, but some there are some things like in the world that are just not perfect. <laughs> and I think that mics are one it's of like those trailers. Things. How come a, a, one trailer can't do everything? Yeah, right. Yeah, you want the unicorn trailer that you can use, haul pellets, but you can also haul, haul mulch. Yeah. You know, and or you like want to tip it and a, then you, you know, whatever. A dump trailer or yeah. a covered trailer. Right. Or like a trailer with no sides you can easily get pallets on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Corby said, do you fertilize your perennials like you do your annuals? Your, yours looks so much bigger than mine. I think ours get pretty good size because they get sun, uninterrupted sun, mm -hmm. sun, 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 without very much cloud cover. Um, and they get consistent water, but no, we do not fer fertilize our perennials other than when we do our like uh, flower tone or plant tone in the spring. And then if they're lucky, they get it mid season, but it's a good once a year application mm -hmm. for us. We do, um, mulch with compost though. And I do think that that is helpful. Laura Green said the flowers are beautiful. What are the trees along the fence with the white bark? You said maple, but I've never seen one with white bark. Those are red point maples and their bark is rather light. It's like a very light gray. Karen said, always exciting to see new plants. Love, love your stone paths. I do too. Question, did you cut the stone on the outside edges? Nope, Pedro and his guys are just that good. You know what they do? So I go through and I make a mark with my foot where I want the center of the pathway to be. So I just drag my foot along and make the kind of curve. And then I usually tell them like, I either want it three, four or five feet wide. And then they put PVC, like very flexible, thin PVC down um, in the way I want it. And they just find rocks. They just like jigsaw this thing together to where it is like perfection. They're fast. You know, you and I did that. It's not that hard when you work on the edges. I feel like they're way better at it. Then, then, and I faster. don't know. I think that you're really good at it too. I think that maybe we're just a little slower at it. Well, yeah, well, for sure, I'm slower at it. You may not be, but I am. No. Um, but yeah, if you work on the edges first, mm -hmm. if you work on the middle first, you know. But here's the problem is that if you work on the edges first, you still have to find large enough pieces for the middle because that's generally where you're going to be walking. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful not to get your big pieces on the 
sides and then put a bunch of little ones in the middle because right. then I mean it's it's fine as long as you um you know seal them in and mm-hmm. you're doing like a proper base but if you're doing it like ours where they're just sitting on the ground mm-hmm. uh then they might tip here or there mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like when we did, when we were working on the path, we would try to find kind of like longer kind of curved pieces that were Mm -hmm. thinner, like it would be shaped like this maybe. And we would put that on the edge and then we would find like on purpose a nice big rock to put next to it. And then we kind of work, we work from the outsides in, but we were really mindful about those big pieces. Stephanie Bloom said, would love a drone view of all the flowering annuals, everything really. Once annual cleanup happens, will the landscape feel slightly naked or bare to you? Yeah, it always does a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's always a little bit of a good feeling, though, when we do it, because usually that, by that time of the year, things are looking spent and tired, and I really don't want to be looking at them anyway anymore. Mm-hmm. And when they first start coming out, I just feel like, oh, there goes work. Mm-hmm. There goes work. You know, a- anything that we do to alleviate that at the end of the season always feels good. I miss it after about a month, and I'm like ready for it to be back again. Okay, the next video, you guys, releasing 450,000 predatory mites in our garden. I had no idea it was going to strike a chord with you guys. Like, I thought it was so neat and I'm so excited about it, but you guys were really encouraging about the whole prospect of trying predatory insects over trying to, you know, use sprays. And um, I'm going to get out there probably, I mean, I've been looking at it a little bit, but we've been so busy with the pond project that, and really, you need to give them a chance to work. It's not like they're going to, like, poof, take care of all the insects right away. So I'm gonna get out there and do some inspecting to see if, they've made, if they've made a dent on anything yet. So we uh, released the Squirsky mites and there's a company called Terravada that's a drone company. And basically they told me they're just a drone company that just looks at everything that we do, that people do and just think like, how could we make it easier with a drone? Is there a way we can make this easier with a drone? So they got with a company called Parabug who's the biggest beneficial insect company in the world. And so it's like a really, good partnership um anyway so they came out they helped me a lot too like tons of information i mean before jake ever even came to and i that was the first time i'd ever met jake but before he'd ever come i had exchanged many a text message and many an email and even a phone call or two with uh, with uh, people at the companies just to learn a little bit more about you know, is this going to be worth it? Is it, am I, this is the right approach. Um, and just some of the, the little bits of information. And I just feel like, you know, this could be a game changer because cost wise, and I'm not sure exactly what it ended up being. Do you remember? They were going to invoice us, right? Yeah. I don't think we've had the invoice, but it wasn't sponsored. We were, no, we paid, paid, we paid for the bugs and we paid for the drone service. Um, but in the end, if you are spraying consistently, like every week, you're mixing up the product, you're taking time to go do it. Um, I think in the end, it's going to be cheaper to release predatory insects. And if it works, then uh, why wouldn't you do it? You know what I mean? And it's not something, you know, Aaron and I talked about, well, we're going to be doing with this, with a drone, most people aren't going to need to use a drone, I'm mm-hmm. guessing, to apply this. You can absolutely hand apply. You don't have to have a drone. I mean, we could have gone out with those things mm-hmm. and, and applied it ourselves, just hand applied it. And I think that that would be the way most people would go about doing it. And you can even, like the ones we were releasing were adults, which means that the the uh, thrip population will be decimated faster because we're not waiting for eggs to hatch and develop. Um, but you can get them in a mixture of adults and eggs, and you can also get them as straight eggs. Um, a lot of times you'll see like little pouches of whatever kind of predatory that you've bought, and you can hook them, just hook them right onto your plant. And then they'll hatch and crawl out of the bag and start feeding off of whatever's on your plant. It's really quite a neat a neat thing. Uh, so D. Weiss said, what are your thoughts at this point on the Dahlia overwintering project? Could the mulching have contributed to your thrip infestation? That was one of my thoughts. I think we'll skip it this year now that we're dealing with this, just to see if that was part of the problem. I noticed a little bit of thrip activity last year. And so maybe that's, you know, they did winter over. Nothing like I saw this year though. So we'll probably, I don't know what we're gonna do. I mean, if we end up up having some extra time, we might dig some of the dahlias. It kind of just depends. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna probably shrink my dahlia patch though, because I'm kind of like, I don't need all these dahlias. Mm -hmm. Like, let's pick out some of our favorite colors and our favorite shapes. I don't need to have 10 dinner plate white dahlias out there. <laughs> you know, I don't like arranging with dinner plate dahlias very much. Um, and they're beautiful, but they're just such huge flowers. I actually enjoy looking at them out in the garden more than I do um, displaying them. Uh, anyway, so I think we could curate our collection just a little bit more and shrink it. So we might just, we'll just see what happens, how it plays out. 
Uh, Cheryl said, was your property a dairy farm in its past? Love watching your videos. It was a sheep farm. So around our house, because our house is over 100 years old at mm -hmm. this point, part of it is, uh, around it was a thousand acres that belonged to the house and that was a thousand acre sheep farm. Kind of interesting. We are the fourth owners of the house. Amy said, can you get beneficial insects for your vegetable garden? I'm fighting cucumber beetles right now by squishing and spraying with pyrethrins, but it's still ongoing. Really interesting subject. That's just something that you've got to, I don't know, but you might be able to. I don't know what feeds on those. Um, you know, I asked Jake if there was a link to those, the PDFs that he printed out. Mm -hmm. They don't have one. Oh. So he sent me images of them, and I don't know if there's any way we could, like, maybe on the screen right now. Let's pop, like, can yeah. we pop them up on the screen? Sure. Um, and that way you could pause and maybe see if one of theirs, theirs that they list takes care of that. Lisbeth said, this type of pest control seems to be very promising and a great step forward from spraying with insecticides. My question is, how long would this last before having to reapply? Would it last for one season? And would these beneficials possibly overwinter and be useful next season also? That's something that I asked Jake. And he said, um, this type of mite can can withstand winter, but usually it's like a 10 to 20% survival rate. Um, so you would need to reapply. It would be an annual application. I think that you'd probably have to plan on that ongoing. Mm -hmm. But one application per year versus once a week through the entire growing season. Right. You wouldn't want to release them too early, though, because if there's no insect for them to feed on, they'll just go away. You got to find the right time. Yeah. So you got to like, you got to be really diligent about looking at your plants, and when you like sense the first whiff of a problem, if there's one thrip, you know there's a lot more than that out there. So get on getting the application done. Jean said, Laura, could you see them being released from the canister? Yes, you could. Uh, gave me the willies having that many bugs floating in the air. Um, you yeah. can see the sawdust kind yeah, of coming out. Yeah, you can see the, the little sawdust. That's what, not, you couldn't see the mites, but the sawdust you could see. You didn't give me the willies. It just was so, so interesting, and I was so excited about them getting to the plants. Yeah, I wonder, you know how much wind the propellers were yeah. you know, pushing? I wonder what that did to the mites in terms of like, like I wonder if it spreads them out. Maybe. Or... Um, if they just flip, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know. It was not a breezy day though, so we had that in our favor. It was just the breeze from the drone. Yeah. Uh, Shelby Kin said, "My uh, was Aaron's heart pounding with excitement when he saw that huge drone." <laughs> Aaron, be honest. You've already looked at the price, haven't you? You asked him <laughs> yeah, <laughs> straight <I did>. up. <laughs> you know, uh, I like what drones do. I, I don't like geek out over the drones themselves. I I geek out like over. It's like the cinematography of drones. I don't really care about drones that can carry large objects mm -hmm. or do that. Like, it's cool. I, you know, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. But I don't really want one. <sighs> <laughs> what did he say? They were like $30,000 or something? Oh, no. I think he said about fifteen. Fifteen thousand. 15000 But he's got a couple. Oh. The you know, the company's got a couple, so... Um, Brian and Tammy Olson said, this is such an incredible idea. And if this works, gardening will be changed dramatically. I know cost will vary, but is this affordable for a normal sized home and yard? Yes. I wouldn't need the drone and could easily spread them by hand. Thank you for all this information. Yes, absolutely. Um, you just need to start. What he told me was you need to Google like uh, beneficial insect applicators or application or insectaries. Mm -hmm. Insectaries, that's a thing. Um, you can order them online. I know when I was poking around, when I initially thought this is how I wanted to go about taking care of this problem, Arbico was a huge one, a huge company that did like beneficial nematodes and other beneficials out there. Um, so I would definitely just start looking around online and you can order the same like little vials or not vials, it was like a- Canisters. Canister, um, if you needed that many, but you can also get them in the little pouches that come in a little box that you can go apply to your plants. Um, so it's definitely a cost-effective way and easy way to, hopefully, hopefully easy way to take care of problems like that. A uh, fan word said, will the mites get on your cats and cause irritation? No, they are not the type of mites that want to be on pets. They want to feed on insects. Okay, and that brings us to our fourth video of the week, which was Aquascape Ecosystem Pond Installation in Day 1. Now, this is feeling much more fresh in my mind yeah. than the other stuff that we did. Um, so the first day, I actually did not plan on filming that day. So, you know, they came out Friday night and we just chatted and looked at the area and stuff. Sunday, they came back and thought that maybe they'd paint out. And I thought we were just going to like size up the area again because it was just, 
it was just a few guys that day. Um, and they thought, we've got the equipment here. Saturday, you mean? I mean, Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they thought, we've got the equipment here, even though the whole team wasn't there yet. Why don't we just get started? Mm -hmm. I'm not glad they did. Because they made major progress. And I would like ran in and got cameras. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, ah, you guys are going to start. I was totally thinking we were waiting until Monday to start right. filming. Um, so we were able to get that one out a little bit early, which was fun. Um, so they got the whole hole dug uh, and they ended up like as they built the pond they made it bigger and bigger yeah. and Brian kept looking at me he's like do you think it needs to be deeper I was like you know he goes it needs to be deeper and then yeah. he gets the excavator and kind of like take out another foot it ended up being it was supposed to be a like an 18 by 20 or 20 by 20 roughly and it's like 50, 50 <laughs> by 25 Five. yeah maybe ish which Honestly, and Brian looked at me because I told him in the beginning they wanted to do 11 by 16, and I was like, "It doesn't fit the it space." Yeah, I told him like we don't really have a space that that would fit in properly where we would even like out in the South Garden having a pond destination that would be a trek. Having it here, it's like steps from like a few more steps than like the fireplace or the Hartley, but it's just steps from the back kitchen. Like it's easy, easy access. It's closer to where we do a lot of our living, like outdoor living, you know? Um, and I just said, I think an 11 by 16 is going to get swallowed up in this space. I mean, I can landscape around it and such, but I think we need to go a, just a slight bit big, bigger than that. And he agreed and he thought, you know, maybe a 20 by 20 and then we'll berm up and kind of, you know, make it the whole thing. But once it was done, he was like, I'm glad. Mm -hmm. Like he knew. And as you know, a designer, it's, you get that gut feeling. And I kept telling him like, if you feel it in your gut, you do what you, you do what you think. Like I tried not to be involved in the decision-making part of that. I just kind of gave them free reign to do whatever. And I'm so glad that I did. I'm mm -hmm. learning in yeah. life, <laughs> learning well, in life. Well, you know, here's the thing though, is that you, the first time you didn't really know if you could trust Brian because you didn't know who he was. Yeah, I'd never worked with You'd any never worked of these with him and, and yeah. I don't know that you'd ever seen his work. And, and so I think you got the confidence from the first time yes. that he really is actually like probably one of the best pond designers ever in the country well know. i remember greg saying if you hate it i'll tear it out yeah. <laughs> and i'm like oh uh, i was just very tentative about the whole thing and it yeah. ended up being the most beautiful thing and i loved it um so yeah I, you're right my confidence was in, instilled after that project was yeah. complete um anyway uh, the whole team was just amazing but it was really hot that saturday when they were digging it was like what 106 mm -hmm and sunny and it was it's it's hotter because of the powdery the powder dirt. it's it like reflects it's like a baking oven yeah. it bakes your feet from underneath and it was still there was no breeze mm -hmm. so it was like uh jill although they did say all of these most of these people came from humid areas mm -hmm. so they're like this is great i can handle 106 yeah. degrees no humidity uh jill said do you have to bring the pump inside in the winter time are you going to stock your pond with koi um so this was earlier in the project by the time you see this video you will have seen that we did go get some koi uh, we get to leave the pond running all winter long in fact you want to keep it running for the koi and i asked about minimum depth if you want to winter over koi uh, fish in a zone six and it needs to be at least two feet deep and ours is three feet deep um, and there's lots of little like they did a little fish cave under there so they can go get in the shade until my lilies kind of like um, establish a little bit more and create a little more shade and the trees around we've got like some intense landscaping around it which will evolve and get even more intense so we'll have some hopefully in the end it's a shaded like little cozy nook yeah. yeah, I love it. Liz said, we must know, what did Monica make for dinner and were there any craft cocktails? No craft cocktails. We did not have time. I didn't have time to even think about that. Um, but it was so nice to have Monica and my mom at the helm of cooking dinner. And they made kind of like that quintessential summer meal. Uh, it was homemade pulled pork and fried chicken. And there was baked beans, potato salad, macaroni salad, big bowls full of, it was the best watermelon I've had this season yet. Um, cantaloupe, kiwi, big baskets full of chips. And then they made, um, oh, they also made pulled mushrooms. So one of the gals was vegetarian that was oh. coming. So they got some like really good mushrooms and made a version of the pulled pork with mushrooms and it was really tasty. Um, so I thought that was really sweet of them to do. And then they made homemade vanilla ice cream and homemade pies. There was cherry, peach, and apple. They went all out. It was really, it was really tasty. Uh, Lemon Ocean said, what a beautiful project. Off topic, what does anyone know? But does anyone know how old Benjamin is now? The chap is growing fast. He is. The yes, chap. Yeah. Yesterday you were like, we were in the car going to get the koi and he came with us. Yeah. 
and he was just like sitting quietly with his like legs crossed just in looking, his little booster yeah looking out the window he looks so tall though i took yeah. a picture of him and i was like look at how big he yeah. is he's five and a half he'll be six in january <laughs> i ask him i'm like benjamin can you just stop growing up just stop right now. Just stop right where you're at. And he looks at me and goes, I can't. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'll pray about it. I'll pray and ask if I can stop growing, but he'll probably say no. <laughs> like, oh, you're so cute. Um, Beth said, what is the cost of a pond like this? So this is a really squirrely one to answer because it's all over the board. And you guys know we don't talk about cost all that much just because we are, I mean, every area is different. The availability of rock or whatever supply you're working with might be different in different areas. Like rock is not abundant right here, um, but there's a lot of people where rocks are just like in their yard already. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it also depends on the crew and all of that. You know, everybody sets prices differently. I know the demographic here, a lot of times things are less expensive than they are like even in Boise, Boise area, way more expensive than they are here. Um, but I think the range for something like this can come as low as 20 if you want to DIY it all the way to like 70 to 80. I think if you were going to have a professional, like someone who's good, like we had, I think you're going to be up closer to 80. Mm -hmm. And if you know, if you go more the DIY route, which means that you're going to have to watch a lot of videos and there's, I mean, these were pros and they were learning from each other. Mm -hmm. There were certain things that they were like, Oh, that's interesting. The way that you do that. I, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about like creating a shelf like this or, mm -hmm. you know, placing this here and have, you know, yeah. So I think that there's so much to it that if you were going to DIY it yourself, I don't feel like you could, it would take you like a few iterations. It also depends on your there. setup. Like this is a chemical free pond. It's using natural bacteria to keep it clean. It, they also tricked it out with filtration. Mm -hmm. They said that the waterfall alone, the filter in that would filter our whole pond. But not only did they do that, they did filters by the pump and they did the water, the wetland filter. Um, so like there's, it's filtered at three different locations. Um, the thing I love about the design, so the pumps are on one side and then, you know, there's water's filtered, goes through the pump and then it it goes over to the wetland filter and it comes up through all of those aqua blocks and um, it's filtered out there and then it moves across like if there's a shallow area there that is perfect for Samantha mm -hmm. it's like a foot deep and there's a log right there that I sit on I just love it um, but she can get in there to play but anyway the water moves across that and then it gets a little bit more shallow like they built up the rocks so that it moves across the top of rocks and that's where bacteria forms so it moves across the top of rocks it looks like it's spring fed mm -hmm. because you've got that movement right there and there's like where's it coming from there's right. no waterfall there's no it looks like it's coming up from the ground and moving across the pond and then you have the waterfall it's just really neat and then the other neat thing that they did is right beneath that viewing like the viewing deck you know where we're going to do the patio you can still see the block wall until we do our paver patio there um, but right at the base of that rock wall there are two jets the jets push water up the face of that rock wall and it pushes water out so if there are you know leaves or any kind of debris on the top of the pond water it pushes it all out and over to the pump so that right where you're feeding your koi or putting your feet into the pond there's never any debris. It's mm -hmm. always clean right there. I was like... That's so smart. Those are the kinds of things that uh, only a professional would know. Right. Like, well, I've done these shelves before, but debris catches right mm -hmm. there. And so it's always messy. Yep. And you don't want to put your feet in. Mm -hmm. Did you know that um, they, after they ran the waterfall, everything was functioning, they were, all of them were looking for dead spots. Mm. And they manipulated rocks a little bit after the fact, because you know how sometimes the water will swirl around and then like there'll be a little alcove back here that just kind of remains a little bit stagnant. Well, they would manipulate rocks so that they'd make sure water mm. was pushing sure. everywhere in the pond so that there was no dead spots. Um, anyway, it was just like I, an education for me, for sure. Also, they chiseled the waterfall rock after they turned it on because it was coming off of both sides and then they had chiseled out another, like notched out another rock. So it was kind of coming down the face of one of the big stones, but they wanted it to be a little wider mm -hmm. on one of the sides so that all the water pressure wasn't on the other side anyway so they get up there and they just start chiseling away rock until they like the look of the waterfall so it's a lot of finesse that goes in afterward but yeah the the cost can just be so depending on what products you use um if you're using a system that's like built to all work together like this I, you know it can just range whimsy cottage said what an exciting project with so many artist experts dumb question what is the region of uh the country where's the rock from okay so i don't know what quarry the rock came from 
I but thought I heard somebody saying that it came from Strickland. Strickland Stone. Strickland Stone is the company that uh, are they sold in Nampa? it. Uh, they're on. I think they're or on Meridian. State. I don't know what they're. It Boise? might be Meridian. One in of the that towns. Area. Uh-huh. Uh, and they quarried it out of maybe Weezer. Really? Yeah. So that's the same stone company where Monica and I got her stairs mm-hmm. for her backyard. Yeah. She and was the lady who was there. I don't, she may have been the owner. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. She gave us a tour when we were there and it was, she was very nice and they were super accommodating. Yeah. Weezer is only like 20 miles away from us. So yeah. I think it's just local stone. Natasha said 1.78 million people subscribe to the channel. Laura, does this ever overwhelm you or is it normal now? And how do vendors feel coming to such an audience platform? I don't know how vendors feel, but I kind of have a hard time wrapping my mind around 1.78 million people. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's just me and, and a camera in the garden. Mm-hmm. It's not like I'm around all of those people all at the same time. Um, and, you know, occasionally it's you and me with the camera mm-hmm. like you know it's just ever a very small group of people <laughs> like are, we're in our that are out. studio in our barn right now yeah just the know? two of us you know um yeah it's just it's really wild it's every once in a while i'll like sit and think like my goodness i mean you know somebody will ask me did you ever think that you would be doing this mm-hmm. no no i i never thought that do it i feel lucky yeah definitely we uh I don't know how we lucked out mm-hmm. so much. Like, we've got a really good community, really good people. You guys who watch our videos are so supportive and encouraging. And like, ninety nine point nine percent of comments are so positive. And I feel like that is rare mm-hmm. on an online platform or in an online platform. Uh, Dana said, "I looked through the links, but I can't seem to find the one for uh, PA." Pennsylvania. Yeah, he doesn't have a YouTube channel. Franco is okay. his name. He doesn't have a YouTube. And then um, he has like a personal Facebook page. He, I don't know that he has a business Facebook page either. I'll have to message him. Some people are a little squirrely with their social media. I feel like... His is the Garden Nation on, on Instagram, yeah, but it's only Instagram. one net N. Only one N. Yeah. The Garden Nation. Garden Nation. Garden Nation. Franco. Yeah. He's really fun. Yeah. He's a cool guy. He had a lot of really good ideas too. Uh, Beth said, so much fun watching this project take off. Question, will you need to add water due to evaporation? Thank you for taking us along on this journey. Uh, yeah, we will have to add water from time to time. They're going to put in like a float of some kind yeah. to where it'll automatically add water when it you know gets to a certain point, I think. Yes. Kind of like just having a Where does pool, that water I come think. from? It'll just be a zone. Oh, well, I think it's. Enough. I think you just plumb a zone to it like uh-huh. a hose. Oh. And then it just turns on. So I don't think it's any different than having a pool. Sure. Interesting. And this is the last video from this week. And it was day two of our pond installation, which was the liner and the rocks. The part in that video that like kind of made me smile was when all the guys lifted the liner up under their shoulders and they started to walk and like they just kept going Mm -hmm. and going. And there was more guys, more guys, more guys. I don't know how many guys were on that liner, but it seemed like there were a ton of them. Um, Anyway, yeah, it was looked a, like a heavy liner too. Yeah, it did. Like thick. Yeah, it was forty by sixty, and that's what Brian Brian said. We brought the forty by sixty liner, so you know, eleven, you know, twenty by twenty, or maybe a little bit bigger, won't really matter, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we did have to do a couple extra deliveries of stone because we ended up making it a little bit bigger, and uh, I'm so happy with how it is. Oh, you know the thing about it, I just I stand out there or sit sit with my feet in it. And as I'm spanning my, like looking across it, it truly looks like you're in the hills. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're sitting on the edge of a creek when you sit in that wetland filter and you look across the logs and there's a stump and then there's like a plant kind of coming down. And then, you know, you see the water just rippling and moving. It legit looks like you're somewhere else and that's the whole goal. You want it to transport you and it does. So Lillian's favorite said, how many layers of the liner did they install? I saw several layers of tarp-like fabric going down. Were those just barriers? So that first one was the underlayment, which is that thick, soft material. And then there was the liner. Mm-hmm. And I think it was just one. And then I think, did they put another one on top of that? Or they no? might have done two. I have to watch back. It was so, so nuts when we were filming. I didn't know what to film because there was always so much going on. Mm-hmm. Because even if like, like one crew was working on the liner, there'd be somebody else over here working on something, mm-hmm. you know? And so you would just ping back and forth and I can't remember, I'll have to watch that back. Um, Susan said, what a beautiful pond and it isn't even finished yet. Is that Paul in the straw hat? No, that was John. John Adams from Knoxville, Tennessee. He has modern 
design aquascapes. Super great guy. Mm -hmm. Loved hanging out with him. And his hat is still here. Oh. I, and it looks like a well-loved, like it's taped and everything. I'm going to send it to him because mm -hmm. it looks like if you went to the effort of bringing it with you on an airplane to yeah. work in, that's your good trusty hat and you're going to get it back. <laughs> How are you handling the hands-off approach to this project? It was the easiest thing I think I have done in a very, very long time. I was stressed out for the moment when it was gonna be my time, which was plants. I had huge piles of plants hanging out. I had absolutely no idea what I was gonna use. I made a last minute call the morning of plant day, 7 a.m. to Jaker, and I was like, can you send over three clump Princess Diana service berries, more Serbian spruce, and Paul raced over there and got them. So glad mm -hmm. because we ended up using um, three more Serbian spruce than I had prepared for. I only had two on hand. We ended up using five, and we're going to add a sixth today. Um, and then I used two of the clump service berries, which are kind of my like like uh, anchor. And, mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're not anchors and like evergreens are, but they're like the showpiece trees. Um, and so, yeah, I was a little- It's gonna look good in the spring. Oh yeah. I was a little nervous though, because it was like this whole group of people and now it's just me, like mm -hmm. needing to play stuff. And oftentimes you guys know how we work in the garden. Like we're planting one or two varieties mm -hmm. a day in a video. And so I get to very slowly work on areas and think about where I want things and layering and all of that. And this was like, you don't have the time because the second you set that plant on the ground, somebody's there with a shovel, boom, planting it. I actually had to say in the beginning, like, hold on just one minute. I'm going to set it. I'm going to run to the driveway, look at it, see if it needs to be moved left or right. And then we can get it in the ground. Um, and there was, so it went really well. And I was just like, boom, boom, Serbian here, this tree here, uh, you know, and then I set a crab apple down. I went to the driveway Then somebody asked me a question. And so I was talking, got that handled, looked around and it was in the ground. That's the only one I have to move because it was a little bit too close to where we ended up putting an oak tree. However, the oak tree wasn't there at the moment mm. yet. So out of all of that, only needed to really good. move that one. I just love how it turned out. Um, Michelle said, this year you've gotten an above normal amount of rain. Can the pond overflow? Is there an off ramp or drainage system for excess water? And conversely, how is the water replenished during? Okay, so we talked about the replenishment. What about pond overflow? I think that'll be probably rare. Yeah, I would think that would be rare. But I mean, it's not out of the question. Like if somebody put a hose in there thinking I need to raise the level a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, if it overflowed, it wouldn't overflow by much. No. But it could cause some like It would just erosion. go into the patio area probably and some soil would get into the pond. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I'll have to ask Greg about that. I don't think it'll be an issue. I don't think so either, but you know. We, it's we, good. It would be a good question to ask just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Sue said, what an amazing crew to get all this done in such a short amount of time. It looks like a slice of heaven being created in your yard. How many fish can a pond this size support? So we ended up with six koi and that one uh, high fin shark. shark, which will be in a video soon. Yeah. Well, you've probably seen it by the time you watch oh, yeah, this. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you could probably do more than that. But uh, Greg was like, let's start with just half a dozen koi. And they're, one of them's like this big-ish. And then the other ones are like r roughly this big. Uh, but I kind of like, I'm, I'm a less is more approach on animals. Like chicken coop, I could ha handle so much more than four hens in that chicken coop. But I like things to like have tons of room. Room to move and breathe. And I don't like overcrowding anything. So I say that about, <laughs> not in the plant world. I like to overcrowd in the plant world, but not in uh, animals, so. Well, I guess the koi will, will have babies. So, like. We might end up having we to We might take having some... as many as it will accommodate. I don't I, know. I don't know how that works, but. I don't either. And there's different varieties of, or breeds. Varieties of koi. <laughs> breeds. <laughs> yeah. Species. Everything's a variety of species. Of, yeah, and. Um, Brian knew them all right away. He's like, oh, you've got this kind. Uh, there's a Tancho. There's a da, 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 da. And I was yeah. like, uh, can you say these on video so yeah. that I can watch this back? Um, and a lot of them, because they're so young, their color isn't fully developed. So they were explaining to me how that would all work. And uh, anyway, I do know the Tanchos are really nice when it's a white one. And it's a, these are all Japanese koi. And they uh, look for like the white koi with like the perfect spot, kind of like the Japanese mm -hmm. flag. Um, but the spot on the top of the one I got is pretty close to round. It's a little bit irregular, but it was a really nice one, hmm. apparently. So I'm very excited about that. Cotton State Country said, is the regular maintenance on it something you guys can do or will you have to have Chris come out? How do you feel about the berms? I love the berms. 
I'm a ber- I'm a berm believer if they're done right. I've still seen some real bad berms done mm-hmm. before, but I feel like I feel like they make this pond area come alive. Mm-hmm. I feel like they were necessary instead of I think my my thing about ponds in the past is so many ponds that I've seen it's just like here's the pond with like this boop of you mm-hmm. know rocks like a big stack of rocks there's a big pile of rocks sitting there and there's nothing around it to make it look anchored to the space mm-hmm. it's just jutting up out of nowhere and i don't love that i love it to look incorporated into the natural landscape which this one does it's so awesome oh and then maintenance is something we can do we'll, we will probably be um calling on chris for a while because we don't know a lot chris said that um he was going to come uh, maybe like this fall yeah they want to come get pond. seasonal pictures of the oh, pond. Really? Yeah. So they're going to come. I told, um, I told them I would let them know when it's like, Hey, it's peak right now. Fall mm. color's awesome. You guys should come and get pictures now, or we can send you pictures, whatever, mm-hmm. the, whatever you want to do. Um, anyway. Yeah. So he'll be out and he's super easy to get a hold of. And he's so great to work with. I'm so glad. I, I want people to like contact all the people that came and helped with the pond so that they get you know, some like business out of it. Mm-hmm. Cause I just, I can't even believe that they volunteered their time yeah. to come and put in this pond. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, how do you say thank you for I that? Know, you know, I know. Like it, <laughs> it's, it's the weirdest thing to be, yeah. I mean, the mo- weirdest, to be most the recipient awesome. Of that. <laughs> yes. It's, you know. Yeah. It's hard to explain it. Uh, and you know, like we said, they do several collaborations like this one every year. They go somewhere, um, and like they did Shaq's pond mm-hmm. and they've done like several other people's ponds. Um, but they chose to come here, which yeah. is so, so fun. Like, how did we get in that list? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, Jessica said, can't wait to see this finished. It's going to be amazing. Question, can the fish go straight in or will you need to treat the water? Uh, we did use a dechlorinator in the water um, because the wa- we did truck the water in. We did not tax our well for that. We bought the water. <laughs> um, so it came in and then um, we did a dechlorinator on it, even though it had set for over 24 hours, which usually it takes about that long for it to all evaporate. Um, but we use that anyway. And then you float the fish in their bags in the water for, we did it less than 30 minutes because it was so hot out and we didn't want the fish to be in this plastic bag right in full sun. So we just let them sit to like float in the water for just a few minutes, like 10 minutes. And then we released them into the water and they will be totally fine to my understanding. Yeah. They're still alive and it's been two days. So since, right. They weren't in there yesterday. No, it was yesterday. Yeah. They've been in there one day. <laughs> They're fine. No, we have no floaters yet. I did um, toss, I let the kids, I gave them a tiny little bit of food Mm -hmm. um, in the bottom of a couple cups. And I noticed so that they're not like comfortable with us yet. Um, But the kids threw out some food and they were kind of starting to sink. And I saw a fish come up and Mm. eat one. So we're going to gain their trust and they're going to be little pets. I'm so excited. And you guys, that is it for today's recap video. We're going to be talking probably a lot about this in the next week's recap because it will like three videos more Mm -hmm. (laughs) of pond. Um content will have come out so we'll be able to you know if you've got more questions put them below the more recent pond videos and we will try to get those answered but it's just been a really wild week with the big predatory mites and the drone and then the big uh, the big pond I was like Aaron it's gonna feel kind of boring when I just go out and plant a shrub in the ground out there like (laughs) we're coming down off this major high tree maintenance tree yeah tree man weeding (laughs) yeah. (laughs) yeah the nuts and bolts of gardening yeah although I do think I'm going to hand thrash the rest of that wheat. Mm. That will be pretty exciting. I think it'll be a lot of work, but I think it'll be exciting. I should buy you a sickle. Well, the thing is, I've got kind of a little one. Uh, Bethany has a, Paul and Bethany have a old iron mill. Oh. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> can I borrow that for a little while? I want to try to make my own flour. Well, that'd be fun. I hand thrashed a little bit the other night. So I went and took like one of those little buckets, um, like a two gallon bucket and just filled it with these, the wheat heads. And it didn't take very many to fill it because they're so bulky. And remember I put them in a hand towel and rolled them up in the hand towel and just kind of like rocked it back and forth and mm-hmm. crushed all of the, this chaff, I don't know, all the stuff off of the wheat berry. Um, and then I worked on getting all of the chaff out. So you take your bucket and you have another bucket below it while a fan is blowing like this and you slowly pour the wheat and the fan blows all the chaff out. Mm. And then you get like cleaner wheat in the bucket and you just keep doing that until you've got clean wheat. And I ended up from this little bucket, 
um, with not that many wheat heads, I've got like two thirds of a cup of wheat berries. Hmm. I think it takes two cups of wheat berries to get a enough loaf. flour for a loaf. Hmm. Oh, I don't know. Every site says something different. So I think that would be very fun. So we'll see if that happens in the next little bit. Nice. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you in the next one. Bye.